good evening. Uh, my name is Jan Turkle, and I'd like to welcome you to our facelift webinar. For those of you that uh, might have suffered along with us without sound here a couple weeks ago, uh, my sincere apologies. Uh, this is another attempt to try to make this happen. Um, but before we begin, um, as usual, uh, you know, any questions asked during the last session um, were emailed, and so I'll kind of cover those at the end of the talk. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. Uh, men and women both uh, tend to choose facelifts to improve the visible signs of aging in their face and neck. Uh, typically, the things we start to see is laxity along the jawline, a kind of a loss of that acute angle in the neck, and uh, the cheeks start to fall. And with all of that, um, you know, several things are out there to try to improve this in a lesser invasive method. Uh, but once we reach a certain point, um, oftentimes facelift is really the only way to uh, make the improvements that many people are seeking. Uh, they were the fifth most popular surgery uh, last year, and of course uh, the reason we're quoting 2013 statistics is that the 2014 statistics aren't in. Uh, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons uh, provide the statistics uh, where they show over 133,000 facelifts were performed in the United States, and I have a feeling that's probably a little bit of a conservative number because most of their uh, information comes from plastic surgeons that self-report, and certainly there are lots of uh, other surgeons that don't necessarily uh, report in this uh, survey that they do. Uh, visible signs of aging in the face, where we start to see kind of sagging in the mid face, we start to see deep creases below the lower lids, uh, the creases that extend from the nose to the corners of the mouth, uh, we call those nasolabial folds start to deepen, the, the cheek starts to drop over the top of that little line, jowls start to appear, and we start to see laxity and excess skin along the jawline and neckline. There are several types of facelift. The traditional facelift is going to tighten the underlying structures, remove the excess skin, and eliminate a lot of the creases. Um, the mini facelift is more limited, and that's typically in kind of that area just below the eyelid and the cheek. Um, a mini facelift will kind of help that early aging appearance. It doesn't do much for the neck. A neck lift is aimed at the lower third of the face uh, involving kind of jowls and the neckline. And then, of course, there's uh, non-surgical facelifts, uh, which we've had some webinars about, where we use fillers, uh, various lasers, ultrasound, Botox, what have you, to uh, try to lift and improve and tighten uh, some of the structures in the face and uh, fill some of the, the voids and make the face look younger in general. Uh, there's a lot of marketing terms. Not all facelifts are the same. Uh, lifestyle lift is a lift that's been advertised, and it's primarily a skin-only lift uh, designed primarily for the jowls, and I think it's probably in its purest form similar to a, a mini facelift. Um, a quick lift is another patented name, kind of version of the mini lift. Uh, feather lift or thread lift were where they took these little barbed sutures and ran them under the skin to try to help hike the cheeks up. Um, the threads, unfortunately, would break and the lift was gone. Uh, that has pretty much fallen by the wayside. Um, vampire lift is where we use uh, platelet-rich plasma injections. Uh, it's basically kind of aimed at kind of plumping the skin. It's not truly a facelift at all. And then, of course, weekend lift is another word for mini lift. It's just another marketing term. Um, the location of the incisions, again, there's some variation on this, but the traditional is either up into the temple or sometimes you kind of come along the hairline itself. And we usually jog just behind that little part of the ear that sticks out called the tragus around the posterior earlobe. It kind of follows the posterior ear crease and then back into the hairline. Uh, more limited or mini is more right here kind of in the front part of the ear. Sometimes you might tuck it behind the lobe just a little bit, but typically not too far back. And then, of course, the neck lift is basically starting at the ear lobe going posteriorly and often accompanied with a little incision here in the chin on many of these lifts. Um, procedures often done with the facelift, uh, you know, the list goes on, but, you know, sometimes liposuction is used to remove some of the fatty fullness in the neck. Uh, in my world, when I use the term facelift, we're getting a neck lift, but some people kind of separate those two terms. 
a brow lift is lifting the upper part of the head uh, or the face where, you know, the eyebrows that are starting to kind of droop over the eyes uh, are being lifted. Um, that's not part of the facelift routinely, but certainly could be combined. Um, upper or lower eyelid surgery or what we call blepharoplasty oftentimes accompanies facelift because a lot of times the same aging process that's affecting the rest of the face is affecting the eyelids too. Uh, occasionally you'll see the need for a chin implant. Sometimes if you look the chin is a little bit what we call retrusive or does not project enough and sometimes just by adding a small implant you can really change the uh, contour and really make a nice difference in the overall uh, appearance of the face. Uh, cheek implants or fat transfer sometimes to enhance the cheek, uh, the various dermal fillers, the Juvederms or Restylane's, the Volumas, the Radiesses, and then of course laser resurfacing because as we talk about a lot of times, you know, when you do a facelift, you're creating a nice um, surface. You're, you're elevating the cheeks, the jawline, and the neckline, but the texture of that skin is still whatever it originally was. So if there's a lot of uh, large pores, a lot of fine lines and wrinkles, a lot of discolorations or broken capillaries, oftentimes laser resurfacing is used to improve those issues. Uh, the ideal candidates uh, are those that are physically healthy with realistic goals and we really need people not to be using nicotine. Nicotine uh, constricts the little vessels that that skin is requiring for its uh, viability and it will cause the skin to actually die. Uh, it can be a real disaster. So we do ask that everybody discontinue the use of nicotine for about four weeks pre-op, four weeks post-op. Um, considerations for this, obviously, we need some form of an anesthetic. Uh, most of these are done under a general anesthetic. Bleeding tends to be a very small amount, but we do ask that people stop things that thin the blood the two weeks pre and post. Infections are very unlikely. It's certainly possible, but again, the blood supply to the face and head is so good. It's a clean surgery. It's very rare to see a problem with infection. Obviously, we're leaving some marks or scars behind, and some of those scars that extended into the hair uh, would very rarely result in a loss of hair in those little incisional sites or any scarring um, around the areas placed that would be visible. Uh, these tend to be in areas that are nicely hidden and generally heal very, very nice, nicely. Uh, temporary numbness is part of the deal. Uh, you know, the face is numb, the ears are numb, that all comes back, but it may take several weeks or even a few months for all that sensation to return. Recovery, uh, we tell everybody, you know, up and walking pretty much from day one. Uh, recommend that you kind of stay with your head elevated about 45 degrees for the first five days or so to minimize swelling and bruising. Um, we say back to cardio uh, in a couple weeks. Um, certainly uh, from the looks perspective, usually within 10 to 14 days, uh, people can be back to their desk jobs and driving. Uh, frankly, many people could be back sooner, but I think by 10 to 14 days, most people are starting to look a bit more normal. Sometimes in the first week and a half, there's a little bit more bruising or swelling and it takes a few days for that to kind of settle down. Um, it may take up to several weeks for all of the swelling to dissipate, but generally I'd say most people are very presentable within 10 to 14 days. Um, it takes the incisions, like all incisions anywhere on the body, anywhere from six months to sometimes over a year to lose their pink and mature. But it seems like uh, with uh, local care, you know, scar massage and that kind of thing, uh, most of these incisions really are very, very presentable within a few weeks. The idea, at least in our office, is that a facelift should give you a younger, refreshed, relaxed version of yourself. Uh, you know, it is not our intent to have you looking like somebody you never were. Um, hopefully it, it just kind of takes off the years and uh, makes you look like somebody that you used to look like rather than uh, somebody that no one recognizes. Um, this is an example of a mini facelift, uh, one day, four days, and one week post-operatively. And I think you can see that even the next day, you know, there's some swelling, a little bit of bruising, and there was some uh, eyelid surgery done as well. Uh, but I think you see that it really uh, doesn't tend to leave uh, too bad of a result within a fairly short period of time in terms of being able to go out and be out and about in the public. Um, 
this is somebody um, before a mini facelift, a month later, and two months later. And I think you can see it just kind of helped to prepare a little bit of this laxity in the neck and the jawline, kind of restored the jawline, sort of restored her nice, elegant neck, and elevated the cheeks back to their proper position. You can kind of see on the side view the nasolabial fold, and this cheek is starting to be a little bit lax. And here it's been kind of pulled upward and back. Another example of a facelift, um, reducing some of the volume in the neck and the jawline. And again, um, around the eyes, uh, upper and lower eyelid surgery, as well as facelift. And I think you can see how it's kind of cleaned up the neck and the jawline. And as she was starting to develop a little bit more of a squared off appearance to the face, you can see it's kind of been restored back to an oval appearance, uh, which was more consistent with her younger face. Another example um, after um, a large weight loss where you know we develop a lot of loose skin in the neck and the jawline and you can see how that's again helped to restore a little bit more of the oval and improve the neck and the jawline. Another example again just to kind of get some of the excess tissue out of the neck and the jawline and you can see how the cheeks have been lifted and elevated. This is an example of a mini facelift, again, with the improvement along the jawline. The jowling is better. And I think you can appreciate the cheeks are a little bit rounder and fuller here in the middle than they were in this picture. Um, upper and lower eyelids and facelift, again, uh, restoration of the contour of the neck and the jawline, and just kind of a refreshed appearance. Again, another um, example of what that does for you. And I think, you know, the idea, I think if you look at the before and afters, is that people look like a, a younger version of themselves. They're still very recognizable. They're not over tight. They're not over pulled. I, I think that's a myth that a lot of people have that, you know, facelifts have to make you look like you've been in a wind tunnel. And I think, you know, this young lady uh, certainly shows that you can reduce a lot of the fullness in the neck and the jawline, lift up the cheeks and brighten the eyes without having somebody look overdone. And men also uh, enjoy the improvement that this gives. This is a gentleman with a lot of excess skin in the neck and the jawline. And again, it's not completely gone, but certainly uh, markedly improved. Um, this is uh, Terry, who uh, was the very last uh, young lady that got to participate in the Indianapolis Woman magazine makeover. And I think you can see uh, what a nice difference it made in her neck and jawline. Um, we also did a little bit of a lip lift. And there's a, it's kind of hard to see on the um, picture here. It's, uh, it's already healing very nicely. Uh, but we took a little bit of skin out from right under her nose to kind of elevate the lip a little bit. You can see the lip was a little bit long here. And that kind of just shortened that upper lip slightly. And of course, around the eyes, you can see that there was uh, eyelid surgery or blepharoplasty done as well. And there she is um, with her new hair and uh, fancy clothes uh, for the photo shoot that day for the Indianapolis woman. And the questions that we were asked that I apologize again to you that um, we lost uh, due to an audio problem was uh, the cost of a facelift. And again, um, our charge here is about $5,800 for the surgeon's fee. Facility and anesthesia probably takes that to around $9,000 um, or $10,000, depending on um, kind of where we're going and, and whether or not somebody's spending the night. Um, one of the questions was, um, is there any order in which uh, multiple facial procedures needed to be done? And I would say, honestly, uh, it's really a matter of priority. If somebody says, you know, my eyes really are the thing that bother me the most when I look in the mirror, then I'd say, by all means, you know, have the eyelids addressed first. And it may be that the facelift is something that waits for a while. Uh, or if somebody says, look, the eyes don't bother me at all, but my neck and the jawline really drive me crazy, well, then I think it really just is a matter of kind of personal priorities. The thing you have to keep in mind, though, is if you're making changes, you know, kind of take a look and just make sure that what you do is going to kind of maintain facial harmony. And what I mean by that is if 
the eyes are really, really saggy and tired, and you only address the neck and the jawline, you may be looking at the eyes later going, gosh, why didn't we do that at the same time? So I think, you know, an honest look at what's going on is probably the best way to approach that. Um, one of the questions is how quickly can you wash your hair after surgery? And it's my habit to tell everybody um, we kind of have you wrapped up in a dressing and, and once the dressing comes off the next morning, I say go home and hop in your shower, uh, carefully wash your hair, you know, get to feeling back to human again. Uh, even though we wash the hair at the end of the procedure with a little baby shampoo, um, you know, you wrap it in that dressing, it's it's kind of a, it's a mess. So I think it always makes sense to go home and, and have a chance to get cleaned up and feel a little more human. Um, one of the questions somebody else asked was they swim every day and wanted to know how quickly they could go back to swimming. Um, I usually say you want those wounds to be really well healed. I would say probably four to six weeks would be safe. Uh, you just don't want to expose any open areas to uh, any bacteria in the water. Um, and I think with that, I will stop. Again, I appreciate your patience with us. I do apologize for our technical difficulties last time. Uh, if you have any other questions that didn't get answered or think of something else, please email us at drturkle at turklemd.com. And with that, I wish you a good day. Thank you.